But um, when I started to write these books in 1952, I wanted to find um, a name which wouldn't have any of this romantic uh, overtones like Peregrine Carruthers or whoever it might be. I wanted a really flat, quiet name. And one of my Bibles out here is uh, James Bond's Birds of the West Indies, which is a very famous uh, ornithological book indeed. And I thought, well, now, James Bond, now, that's a pretty quiet name. And so I simply stole it and used it. A series of white circles appear across the screen. They reach the edge and one circle opens up and suddenly the audience is looking through the inside of a barrel of a gun. A man casually walks to the middle of the screen. He quickly turns, points his gun, and fires at the camera. Blood pours down as the circle shakes and disappears. It has to be one of the most memorable openings for any film series. Sometimes I'll wonder how such a seemingly simple, almost silly idea has endured for so long. But I guess sometimes the best ideas are the simple ones. I mean, I would have expected that maybe once Connery had left and they wanted to change things around, someone would have suggested of just losing this opening altogether. That maybe it looks silly or too old-fashioned, or to make a different opening for Moore or something. But no, it's stuck around ever since. This gun barrel intro was designed by Maurice Bender as part of the credits to Dr. No. After the circle disappears, it starts a motif of abstract, animated colored dots during the credits. Since then, the gun barrel has become a signature opening to the films. The idea does seem like it fits perfectly in the era of 60s psychedelic images and pure grooviness. Whether this gun barrel opening was in any way influenced by the 1903 The Great Train Robbery closing scene is anybody's guess. It is interesting to note that Connery hadn't filmed his gun barrel scene until Thunderball. The three previous films featured stuntman Bob Simmons filming the intro. I doubt that when Bender created this for Dr. No way back in 62, he could have predicted this intro would become a significant logo in the Bond mythology and be a recurring trademark of the character and have it be used in countless publicity materials and merchandise and parodies and the opening for films yet to come. It's an enduring example of the power of an opening image in terms of establishing audience expectations. James, please be careful. We're immediately tossed into a mini Bond adventure, a short film that throws us into Bond's world and is an appetizer of things to come. This can either be a standalone mission Bond is sent on, or can be used as a jumping off point to the story. From Russia with Love was the first to start the pre-credit sequence. Initially, this scene wasn't intended to come before the credits, but ended up there through the editing of the film. After the popularity shown for the character in Dr. No, filmmakers thought it would be fun for him to get killed off immediately. Of course we know he isn't really dead, but the setup is intriguing and gets your wheels turning as to what's going on and what will happen. Connery's pre-credits went back to this trick of getting the audience to believe Bond is dead a few times. Well, at least he died on the job. He'd have wanted it this way. When a new actor stepped into the role, or when Connery returned, the sequence was designed to build up anticipation of only giving hints of Bond, before finally giving him a dramatic reveal. And then some action would follow. Except Roger, though. He got gypped. He has just left. He has just left. Over and out. Message received. We are waiting. Over and out. By the time The Spy Who Loved Me was released, it set the bar for even more impressive stunts and spectacle. At times, the pre credit sequence is better than the film's climax. I mean, it's definitely become a motivation not to come in late when you're watching a Bond film. The 
title sequence is another signature design of the films that can be attributed to Maurice Bender again. Dr. No introduced flashing patterns of dots and weird silhouetted characters moving across the screen with the credits. Bender, who designed the titles in Dr. No, went on to work on every film from 65's Thunderball to 89's License to Kill. Robert Brown John stepped in on From Rush With Love and Goldfinger. Swirling neon titles over silhouetted sensual images of naked women. Nice. It was a striking concept in the early days, and it fit in with the world of Bond. At best, the title sequence could display the themes and ideas of the film in an erotic fashion. At its worst, it could come off more like a music video. But there were always hints of nudity that kept the adolescent boys tuned in. At one point, a Bond title sequence was your best hope of catching something naughty. If they would only move that person's name a little, you might be able to spot... Darn. This raciness caused some problems when the early films were first broadcast on television. Some of the more erotic images would be cut or pixelated over in some cases making the opening credits unreadable. I would be pretty upset if I had my credit cut or my name illegible just because it was resting on a pair of boobs. Everyone is so uptight. Charming tune. The Bond theme, written by Monty Norman, itself has become as famous as the films. I mean, you hear that theme and you know who it belongs to. With composer John Barry's arrangements on the theme, it became iconic. The arguments of who actually deserves credit for the theme, Norman or Barry, is still going on today. Anyway, John Barry helped place a distinguishable stamp on the sound of Bond since Dr. No. Being resident composer for 11 out of the next 14 Bond films, he defined the musical sound of Bond. His compositions accompany Gypsy Cat Parade, <laughs> Palace Attacks, <laughs> Ski Chases, Space battles. The title song for Goldfinger really was the beginning of the Bond themes forever after. With a big brassy sound and a singer just belting the hell out of the lyrics, it became the template for all to follow. Most of the time, the theme would incorporate the title of the film into the song, but not always, although I would love to have heard what this one would have sounded like. Barry's last Bond work was on The Living Daylights, and I kind of wish he would be brought back for a film. Hey, Chief, mm -hmm. you know when Shirley Bassey's closing number, Goldfinger? Yeah. How you wanted the set painted gold? Right. Well, we don't have any gold paint. <laughs> no. What? The best we can do is kind of a rust color. <laughs> uh, Scooter, she's not going to sing Rust Finger. Mm -hmm. Haven't you got something closer to gold? Well, what if we bring in some ice and she sings Cold Finger? 